All right, so welcome everyone to the future of education with Professor Becky Parker. Uh, my name is Joan Orgel and I work for LearnLife. Uh, I'm a, a learning guide, also a teacher trainer, and my role here is going to be to be the host and moderator of this call tonight. Real quick, the idea of the call is uh, we're gonna we're gonna have uh, an interview with Becky Parker for around 40, 45 minutes or so. Uh, please feel free to like be interactive, post your questions in the chat, uh, add what your concerns, ideas, and comments are in the chat. And at the end of the call, we can have room for maybe 10 minutes or so uh, in which we can unmute ourselves and share what our takeaways are from this call. Mm -hmm. uh, I would encourage you to think about, if you're educators, to think about no, no. Your, your community. So think about your school, think about your learners, think about your learning community, and think about what are the questions you have to uh, in order to take away and things to, to implement uh, some of some of these uh, the things that we will be sharing uh, tonight. So uh, let me just share a little bit about LearnLife, who we are. So at LearnLife, we promote and implement a purpose-inspired learner-centric model. Uh, we have our own learning hubs in Barcelona for learners age 6 to 18. And we also provide other schools and educators with uh, teacher training, professional services, recruitment, assessment, and so on. In parallel to that, we're building a community for innovative educators in which we run courses, workshops, discussion groups, groups, and webinars, as this one uh, today. About Becky, uh, which is our guest. So Becky is a British physicist and a physics teacher based in Kent. She's a visiting professor at the School of Physics and Astronomy, Queen Mary University of London. And back in 2016, she created the Institute for Research in Schools to support students and teachers doing authentic research through a wide range of projects in STEM. And now with no further ado, please uh, warm welcome to Becky Parker. Hello, hello, it's so lovely to see, well, I can't see all of you, but when I'm scrolling through, it's brilliant. Thank you for coming. So um, just to give you a quick um, insight into what drives me for millions of years being, I'm still in the classroom, uh, and passionate about teaching, I talk all day today. Um, my fundamental belief, which I think education systems have got wrong, is that we don't value enough what young people can genuinely contribute. And that's really why I set up the Institute for Research in Schools, which has expanded and, uh, you know, got hundreds of schools involved now. Um, what really worries me is when we're teaching stuff we need to empower students we need to give them enough insight so that they feel that this is valuable it means something to them and that we value their contributions and also that it's gorgeous that it's amazing that it's an amazing you know i'm sitting here as the sun is just setting uh, i live just south of canterbury and you think you know they need to understand the amazingness of magnetism of sunsets of uh, you know, how the world is. And in a sense, I suppose my passion now is to somehow drive that energy and innovation from young people to help tackle the planetary crisis. So I teach physics, but I have lots of interests about trying to engage young people. And the reason I do, and then I'll shut up and get on with this lovely discussion, is that if you read this book by um, Sarah Jane Blakemore called Inventing Ourselves, she says this beautiful bit, adolescence is a time of heightened creativity and novel thinking, energy and passion. Now, in most UK schools, this time when they're most creative, we say, can't do anything, you've got to just do exams, you've got to get tick, 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 tick. So quality of your GCSEs uh, just does my head in. And at the moment, I still have to do that, of course. But I do that as an aside, so to speak. Well, obviously, the kids get great results and everything, but I want them to love the subject. I want them to feel as though 
they have a voice, they have agency, they can do stuff. Science should be real. STEM should be real. It shouldn't be a whole set of stuff which has no relevance and isn't equipping young people for the future, which is so dominated by science. So I think that's a bit of an essence of me. Is that okay? That's okay. That's perfect, actually. Uh, Becky, STEM, what are we talking about when we talk about STEM? What is it? Well, STEM is science, technology, engineering, maths, used to be medicine. It's sort of that broad thing. And it seems to have taken on as, you know, we need to push STEM subjects. And in loads of ways, there is a huge synergy across particularly my subject, physics, maths, technology, and in an ideal world, I actually think you would teach STEM, but you'd actually call it like natural sciences or, you know, natural philosophy even. you I, I actually, I don't like the term STEM because everybody says STEM as though that's sort of fundamental, but actually... You know, physics impinges on philosophy. Uh, there's so much creative work in colour, in light, in stuff like that. To be honest, the whole of this divide is very forced by how we run curriculum. And one of the things I'm trying to do with climate stuff is say, right, how can we express this through movement, through art, through music? So much music and physics together. And I think students work like that they don't just box oh now well I mean they have to but now we're doing just physics just chemistry just biology just math and and there are efforts to try and show young people that the world out there is interdisciplinary multidisciplinary transdisciplinary whatever you call it loads of disciplines all together and there isn't such a box so we use it a lot to promote efforts to increase enthusiasm for these subjects because there's mm -hmm. dire shortage anyway in the okay. UK or going and, and isn't it learners to do all subjects at once and how, how does it look like in the classroom like how how does this happen well for example if you run a science club that's what we do and we run lots of research then learners yeah, just can... get the hang of a challenge so for example we're doing an amazing project where learners are modeling um, simulations of impacts onto the International Space Station. So they've learned all the coding. So this is normally in physics, but of course this is interdisciplinary without a doubt and part of STEM. So they've learned about why you need to protect astronauts in space because of impacts coming at something like five kilometers a second. And they've learned how to model what these impacts look like so that we don't have to actually try and do all the tests up on the International Space Station. We can simulate these and they can understand and then we can hopefully create better structures which are still light but actually manage to survive impacts. So real science education, I mean I suppose it's real for me, real STEM education is about doing stuff where it really has an impact they can see it's it's the world happening and how they can improve it and what they can do to understand it really so could we say that stem education is science science technology engineering and math applied into a project so the learners understand the why i think that's more how it's taken uh, so lots of schools i know in the uk do a, like a stem club or a stem lesson where they try and say design things you know they might design a trebuchet which is dt design technology plus you know understanding how projectiles work so it is sort of envisaged as trying to bring these skills together because of course there's very many overlapping skills across all these subjects and actually there isn't much insight as far as I can see in most schools into what it is to be an engineer. And of course, there's such a shortage, especially with girls. There's not enough, well, not enough women going into engineering, not enough women going into computer science and engineering. So it's a way of trying to excite them and engage them and bring these subjects to life. 
and and what else what else could we do like because here you tackle the big problem uh we don't have enough uh women uh in, in science how can we promote that like how do you see what are the things that need to happen in the next 10 years so we have uh more representation well what i would do and i may be quite radical but i would initially chop all school curricula in half and of course when i suggest this at meetings people say oh well you can't do without hook's law you can't do without specific heat capacity oh my goodness the whole planet would collapse but of course it wouldn't because when you need to know things you can learn them you know students you know have done amazing projects and learned stuff they need to know so i would at least cut out half and then what you've got a chance to do is the stuff you are teaching you can you can really allow students to get inside it understand it for example is an example of what i've been doing today I have to teach radioactivity, so alpha, beta, gamma radiation, but you don't actually explain why nuclei are unstable. No, that's later on. You have to then think about that when you're older. But the essence of learning is to get a deep understanding. So if I did much less, that actually enabled the students to really get a grip of why you know model the nucleus as this wobbly balloon of water and have it right all split and stuff come out and what happens and talk about fundamental principles you know I've always been up for teaching quantum theory at year eight you know when they're about 11 or 12 because I think then it would be so lovely for students to not have to say oh well now I have to re relearn this and understand this at a, a different level because students are so open-minded I'm sure they could cope the other thing I would do then so I'd teach much less content and really develop understanding the other thing I do is I would so when I um so the Institute of Research in Schools came out of a whole load of projects I ran at my school and we did amazing things you know students put stuff up in space they looked at dark matter and there was never an issue then about more girls or more boys girls engaged with real stuff where they could make a contribution in exactly the same way I had girls um giving papers on evidence for dark matter I had girls talking about um uh like strategies they had to tackle diabetes in their communities we had shut me in fact we had more girls presenting on research papers than we had boys I, I and and I think the fundamental reason we don't have enough girls is it's just not relevant enough and it's not allowing them to have a, mm. a voice and to contribute and contribution I like the, the idea of contribution and uh, you talked about launching things in the space with uh, learners. Can you tell us more about that? I think like we all want to know more about that. Yeah, so that was um, balmy uh, and also a bit serendipitous, to be honest. So I have taken over a thousand students to the largest experiment in the world, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN outside Geneva. And uh, one year, in 2007 they were just preparing to start up the Large Hadron Collider so we weren't able to go down to the tunnels so they asked um, the community could you test out a new model whether school groups could go and visit a different research group rather than just going down and going down into the uh, actual tunnel itself and so randomly luckily one person who volunteered was Michael Campbell who runs the Medipix collaboration now these chips are amazing in fact yesterday I was showing these because I've, I've still got one at school I was showing the students they show radiation like you you know normally in school you get bleep 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 from detecting whether there's more or less radiation mm -hmm. here it visualizes the invisible, it makes it clear. So you see like alpha particles really chunky and things like that. So, let, so let's let's stop there, just one second. 
Yeah. You're saying that you got a group of learners connect somehow with someone in the Hadron Collider in Geneva. How do you yeah. do that? Like, how does a how does a teacher get like how does this happen? Because I think this well, is very relevant for for maybe educators listening to this conversation now. Well, it's now you can go on tours to CERN now. Um, when we first sort of got involved, so I suppose take it back a step. When I was teaching, I said, why is it we don't teach anything past 1930 in physics? You know, there was no particle physics at all. And people said, well, you know, we don't, uh, you know, we can't possibly teach particle physics in school. So a group of us um, got together and we wrote a curriculum for 16 year olds to learn particle physics. And we took this quite seriously. You know, I went and gave a talk to Frank Close, who's um, you might have read his books. He's written loads. He's a professor at Oxford. I gave a talk to the whole particle physics community. That was scary. And I said, you know, this is our plan for the curricula. These are sorts of questions. And I remember Frank Close saying, Becky, you really asking them to do those questions? And I said, yeah, Frank, can't you do it? You know, this is like, no, you know, jokey. Um, so we basically got this approved by the one of the exam boards in the UK. And now particle physics is in every single exam board. And while we were doing that, CERN got wind of it and so invited this group of us over. And that sort of started doing these teacher conferences for uh, different groups of teachers from across the states of CERN. So I know Denmark, Italian, uh, I think they do them for many different groups of teachers now. And then, of course, since I met people at CERN, I said, well, what about if I bring 50 students over? The reason I bought 50, most people normally bring a few on a plane, but it was so much cheaper for my students, you know, to a state school, not, not private education, to actually be on a bus for, you know, we're, we're quite mm -hmm. near Dover. We could just spend 12 hours on a bus and get to CERN. Mm. So I started taking students to CERN. And then, of course, you know, if you just, so they asked, because I was the person, I think I'm still the person who's taking the most, um, the most students to CERN, because I was that person, they asked me, would you test out this new mechanism mm. while we've got the Large Hadron Collider and we can't have people down the tunnel? Will you test it out with this Medipix collaboration? So of course I said, yes, God, brilliant. So we went and saw these chips and, um, I said, Michael, these should be in school. They're amazing. And he said, oh, I'd really like that. But, you know, it's really difficult. You know, they're a bit busy designing these detector chips for a large heaven collider. So I said, well, I'll sort that. And so we went back home. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this as a teacher, members of the audience, but you're exhausted from having four days out with I, I did. kids. I did. And, and. You go into your lab for your first lesson and the students say, this is so boring. I just, I just taken you to saw. Anyway, so I said, well, um, look, there's this competition uh, to put something in space. Uh, why don't we see if we could do that? You know, thinking, well, that'll keep them busy for five minutes. And um, one student which was genius actually and he's now a top physicist you know I've kept up with him I just went to meet his son who's one year old um he said why don't we put those chips in space and I said wow and it's sort of I, I still think oh. of it <laughs> had that shiver moment and Wait, so I said I said great so I phoned up Michael Campbell and I said we've got this idea to enter this space competition and he said, oh, well, NASA would like that because, of course, they haven't yet space qualified these chips. They want them to go on the International Space Station and they haven't yet put them into space. You know, you have to do this procedure for allowing stuff to go into space. So uh, we worked with Surrey Satellite Technology. Uh, we went on about 50 trips to sort this. So, Becky, now... Out. 
now when you when you talk about we went into these trips what who is we it's oh, like in a group of learners how, how does yeah. it work so i got a whole you know the whole buzz affected the whole school and my numbers doing physics went up ludicrously from about 60 to 240 people doing a level physics which is quite a lot and, and loads so, of girls. so but this is connected to what we were talking so i think two, th two things one is because the the what we're trying to to answer in this webinar is how does the future of science education look like yeah so on one side from from, from listening to what you say is uh building engagement and to build engagement, we need to make it meaningful. Yep. To make it meaningful, the learners need to connect with a purpose and a reason. So instead of doing it in a vacuum, we do it applied. And we do projects in which the learners will have impact. You've tried these things already, and you had great success. And you had like hundreds and hundreds of learners choosing, like opting in into your subjects, because in in this way that, that, are, that you designed them, that are engaging, what is... What are some things that are relevant for the educators that are listening here of, okay, how can I make it more engagement? How can I make it more, more meaningful? Also, I listened to what you said at the very beginning of, we need to listen more to kids. We need to listen to them more. We, we have to, uh, to, to hear them because all, some of these ideas that you're sharing can't come from them. And the fact of you listening to them already connects with the agency ownership so they they feel heard they, they feel respected right so yeah what else can we do to make engaging uh science or stem activities well i think once you i mean what was clear about this project is once you create a culture of that i mean the project took a long time because we were proper payload on a tech demo sat one um i just checked before uh, this meeting, but actually the data the students provided was used in the initial preparation of the Artemis and Orion launches. So it has been useful to NASA. You know, my students reported to NASA, gave presentation, all those sorts of things are brilliant. So I think creating the culture where that's what you do and also allowing the students to then teach the others because this project lasted for 10 years till we wrote till the students not me till the students wrote a big paper and it, it branched off in all you know we got thousands and thousands and thousands of frames of data from space they had to learn neural networks machine learning they had to gear themselves up and the older ones always taught the the year below and it kept cycling so that it was a whole project involving hundreds of students and I think initiatives like that one thing we did with the Institute for Research in Schools is we set up a way that students could annotate a Whitworm genome and that was thousands of students to actually contribute to something real and there are loads of opportunities to do this I mean only just this week um, there was a whole thing about how we need to monitor walruses because that will uh, enable us to see how they're being affected by climate change. Zooniverse in the UK is an amazing platform for interactive projects across the spectrum of sciences. Of course, there's Institute for Research in Schools. But also, what's your passion as a teacher? I mean, I love particle physics. And so... You know, it was, and that's why I wanted to get it into A-level and that's what, you know, snowballed into going to CERN and doing this amazing experiment in space and everything and trying to get these chips into schools. I mean, if you got a passion yourself, because that's always going to work and also don't feel that it's going to completely take too much of your time because once you establish the confidence of the students, mm -hmm. it runs itself and the students take ownership and honestly, the growth in them and the ability to, you know, speak and um, collaborate and inquire and sort of, you can see their whole sort of um, selves growing with these research projects. Honestly, it's such a delight. I've got a group now, we're working on climate stuff, and when they do their own thing and they are 
uh, writing this or reporting here or speaking here, their, their whole confidence and enjoyment and engagement grows. So it's just, you know, it's sort of um, self-fulfilling. It, it really uh, avalanches into sort of like a culture of mm. opportunity and empowerment is what I would say. What are, what are the, no, I, I mean, I agree. I'm actually, I'm listening. I don't know if it's the rest for, for all the attendees here, but I'm listening to you and I'm feeling very inspired because you're so passionate about the, your topic that it's inevitable that you will inspire everybody else. But uh, I wanted to ask you a question. What are the age groups that you teach? Because I know you've done something in university, but also in schools. Like, what are the, the, the learners that, that you teach? Well, age. I only teach um, uh, age 14 to 18 at the moment. I mean, I'm in a normal school uh, and um, we did do some sort of science club stuff with 11-year-olds. Uh, um, I think I think probably that's, you know, I have introduced these projects and to get involved from age 14 up I think the only trouble is you know in most UK schools when you're 15 16 they don't want you doing anything because you're supposed to be just focusing on GCSEs mm. and then you've got one year of the the lower six and and that's where mm -hmm. I think the potential to really engage students like this when they're about 16 17 is um, amazing really and and how does it work? Because you were talking about a project that extended for over ten years, and hundreds of students involved. How does that work? Like some learners would be involved for five years, maybe others for three. How's the? Well, yes, there was a few who started actually when they were thirteen and carried right on through till they were eighteen. Most, I would say, most were really only involved for like eighteen months. They would start in the sixth form and then. When it came to doing their final exams, they would sort of uh, step away a bit. But as long as you've got the communication between those students and the continual support. So this student who had this idea initially, you know, I'm still in touch with him. And he uh, sort of kept being like a mentor, even though he was doing his undergraduate, his PhD, his postdoc. And that's a, a lovely thing to keep involving students who have left but are continuing in STEM back in the school if that's feasible, because that is so powerful because it's always going to be better somebody much more their age than, you know, uh, somebody uh, supporting them, encouraging them, saying, well, these are the options you can do. And then it opens these um, students ideas about possible futures they've got and careers and and pathways they can take. Hmm. Uh, what should not what what should we avoid to happen in in stem or science classes like because maybe i don't know like maybe you have visited uh, other schools and talked to other uh, teachers what's something that we should avoid to happen in our classroom when we run uh stem subject i think and i think this happens because teachers are sort of often anxious about this but I think a lot I think it shouldn't be too controlled by the teacher I think you've got to you know empower the students so here's an example I've set uh, up with colleagues this group called biojoyversity about how in schools we can increase biodiversity and there's been loads of research done in my school, which says that just spending 10 minutes in a biodiverse area improves your mental and physical well-being. So that's why it's bio joyversity. And uh, I want to extend that out to make a, like a futures thinking space. And it's very easy for me to say, well, shouldn't we be doing this? And then I say to my students, I say, shut me up, you know, stop that, Parker because actually it's your what is it you want and then 
and I just sort of hide a bit in the corner and just let them go and they come out with it because it's very easy as a teacher to be too controlling of what students do you've got to trust the students and some things won't work and some things will be a bit daft but it doesn't matter that's you know half of research things don't work do they I mean it's not as if everything has got to be perfect and that's also good particularly for girls as well I think there's such a thing we've got to get this perfect got to get the answers right maybe science comes because people are you know uh make mistakes and then they try something else uh, and so many experiments don't work you know the whole supersymmetry thing at CERN they haven't found any evidence of that yet people have spent lifetimes working on it so I think you know we've got to trust that students have the capacity to run with things without being you know steered let them go let them give them enough backup and give them enough support and give them enough contact so in my biodiversity site we've got 24 amazing advisors who are there to suggest backup if students have particular questions and I think I think that's what we need. We need to give students a mechanism to have support from outside when they want it, but to actually trust that they've got the ideas, the imagination, the creativity, because I really think they have. And yet they don't think they have, yet they have. So, so, so teachers should maybe use more or build a habit to use resources beyond their, like resources in the reach, but beyond the classroom or beyond the book but also maybe yeah. connect to others uh, and so on. Okay. And also what, follow what, is, what sorry. students want. No, you go you ahead, know. go ahead, yeah. I think, you know, some students were asking something and I said, oh, that's a brilliant question. Well, like today we were looking at MRI scans and, um, and somebody said, so do you think we could ever, you know, do you like one of those awful science fiction things and, you know, read out what our brain is thinking um, remotely? And so we just did a little explore of all that sort of research. There's amazing stuff going on in California about somebody watching a film and you actually reading out what the film is that they're watching. Uh, obviously not perfect and nothing's, you know, it's just sort of big images of elephants and things. But um, students are like, oh my goodness, you know, you want that sort of wonder and you want to be able to, and that's why you want to cut out actually more than half of the curriculum. You want to be able to follow those, you want students to feel they can say, what about this? And follow those, you know, them. Yeah, I think that the idea of the curriculum at the end, because there's there's this fear, no, with like inst public institutions or like governments have fear of okay, if we cut the curriculum in half, how do we, and how can we compile evidence enough that our learners are are learning? So it comes from this idea of I need to get sure, I need to, and and I need to monitor, I need to control, right? So it's and what you're proposing is. A dynamic of empowerment instead of a dynamic of of control, which is yeah. changing the game, and it might feel unsafe for institutions and professionals who are not from education at all, and they it's it's at the end them who make the the decisions. Not sometimes. I was I was thinking one thing because everything you I don't know I, I don't know if this is the same for for everybody else in this call, but I'm feeling a little bit of a scientific now, and I I have no clue about science. I've never been. Uh, I never felt I, I'm, I'm good at it, but I feel this curiosity now, uh, this this willingness to to inquire, uh, to know more, and I think this is what we could call scientific culture, like building hypotheses, questioning. Uh, how do you make a strong scientific culture in a classroom or in a learning community? How 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 how? What's the process to make that? I think, I think there's a real danger uh, and we have to you know the curriculum is such that you are supposed to teach all your practicals in terms of make hypothesis test it and then exactly as you say I think there's a real danger of making science quite boring like that mm -hmm. because actually if you think about people who did balmy things you know the scientist who had a dream about benzene ring joining up like a snake you know Einstein didn't 
he had these amazing thought experiments, you know, and rode around on a bike and imagined what would happen if he traveled near to the speed of light. Um, I think there's a real danger in knocking out the creativity of science. And so many people say, oh, the creative subjects and then science, but you know, science mm. is the most creative subject in my book, I would say. And so I, I probably am a bit, I, I, you know, I say, you've got to know, you've got to be able to do this for the exam. But, you know, what about, what else could we do? What, I mean, we, we have got to make students realise that, you know, astrology is not a science and astronomy is, and what's the difference and try and instill some kind of, you know, rigour about science for how they're going to live their lives in the future. And also, if they're going to go into science, it depends how you're going to break this system in a sense. You need to have a lot of baggage to go on and do a science degree, to do a PhD. And it's really interesting. My students who've done amazing research say first year of undergraduate university is so boring because, of course, they've yeah. done proper stuff. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's a lot of change needs to happen to really mm -hmm. rather than sort of like grind them through this pipeline to let there be ways of engaging people where they have enough figure you know we, we need people to know how to put stuff in space and to know things which are gonna you know create um the high-tech future for the world if that's what we want you know but so there's, there's got to be a level of understanding, but so much of that, I remember arguing this when the students were putting this payload in space and one head teacher was saying on the radio, see, the thing is, you know, they're not learning, they're A-level. And I said, but they are, they're learning far more because they're learning about radiation, they're learning about circular motion. They have to because they're putting a payload up in space, you know, they've got to learn this stuff. So it's not like when I met the science minister in the UK, uh, the education minister in the UK, they're sort of like, you know, this is woolly. I said, it's not woolly. There's no wooliness about it at all. It's very rigorous. If you actually allow people to do real science, then it's better. It's better because they get an understanding that science doesn't always provide perfect answers, that most of it doesn't work. You know, loads of mm. stuff about what science really yeah. is. Yeah, because maybe you were sharing more of a let's establish a, a scientific culture like a, an understanding of science that it's different and it's holistic and it's actually more real yeah but maybe this politician was reluctant to that because okay how do i you know <laughs> yeah so but, i raised yeah, on I and he said what textbook do you use and i went ah. <laughs> but yeah. maybe that's that's our role like to push and to push and to push because it's so hard. Well, I don't know. I think in the UK it's going the other way. I think I don't. Uh, I think it's quite hard mm. to get people to realise, especially after the pandemic, that education must mean something to students. Yeah, it's yeah. become so sort of grinding. I have a, a very interesting here uh, question in, in the chat by Alex Goodall from Oxford. So uh, Alex asking. Where do you see the connection between science and philosophy? Because we talked a lot about science, technology, uh, and math combined together in STEM. But what about the connection between science and philosophy here? Well, I I do a lot about um, various. I mean, on a practical level, like color perception. I always say to students, you know, how do I know that, you know, this? Uh, I sort of get a thing like this, and I say that this green. Um, glasses case is green and the kids go but miss it's not it's black and I said yes I know that's what I mean I mean how do you know that what I see is the same you know that sort of stuff I do a lot about philosophy of quantum mechanics because that's another area I just love and so you know when we do wave particle geology that's why I think we should teach that at age 11 or 12 when you teach students that you know an electron isn't just a little tiny marble, it's, um, you know, a bundle of waves and that it has these wave properties. It's sort of extraordinary that that then leads them to think, well, I encourage them to think, you know, the whole measurement problem, how do you know what reality is out there? And I know that 
it, I, I try not to do it too woolly. I try to be really rigorous about that because I think it inspires students to think how does physics which is trying to understand the smallest things and the beginning of the universe, how does that actually, how can it give meaning to questions such as what is reality? You know, can we try to answer things like that through quantum theory? Not really in the sense that it goes against our common sense. So how is our common sense not you know, why should, what does Einstein say, common sense is those set of prejudices um, you mm -hmm. acquire by the age of 18, you know, how, how do we open up people's minds to see that actually physics can help you, I mean, with philosophy, I was lucky, because when I was a student, I had uh, Professor Tony Leggett, who um, got the Nobel Prize for Physics, he was one of my tutors, and he famously started doing a degree in philosophy and then decided he needed to do physics to understand more and then when I went to Chicago to do research I um, worked with him on um, like Schrodinger's cat but for bigger things and her laboratory kittens so you know I uh, I've always been trying to encourage students a bit like this awe and wonder stuff I saw epistemic insight on there as well you got to get the awe and the amazingness of science it's not boring it's amazing it's about the universe and how we understand it and that and that I think impinges a lot on philosophy and so I try and get little snippets in and I do extra talks for the whole sixth form and things like that in fact I'm doing one next week about you know how is the quantum world how we see reality or how you know I don't know if that's quite the way I wrote it but you know uh, you know what is the nature of reality in the quantum world I hope that's okay as a uh, slightly worried that I'm now uh, I, I think I'm pretty rigorous I've done quite a lot of philosophy so hopefully I'll <laughs> get it right <laughs> what I'm listening here because I listened to you and you were talking about you are defending science is not, bo not boring that's that's a statement that you said and yeah. And this is a statement that, that many uh, science uh, teachers say, and also math teachers. And it seems that there are some subjects that need to fight against, like we, they, they need to say, we are not boring because there's some sort of, I don't know, perception that those subjects are. But, but I want to say like, listening to you, I don't have that feeling and I would sign up to your, to your class right now, to be honest. Uh, we have more questions here in, in the chat. One from, from Derek. Uh, thinking about learners aged uh, 7 to, to 11, what do you think are some activities or ways in which we can uh, grow their interest in, in science and, and engineering for, for the little ones, primary school and so on? Now, that's interesting because um, I have worked with quite a lot of primary schools and in my mind, especially in some of the climate work we've been doing, it's extraordinary how um, sort of wild and amazing ideas they can have if they're just allowed um, a chance. It, I think that is quite a lot dependent on whether the teacher is confident because so many primary teachers think, oh goodness, physics is hard and, or, or, or stuff like that. But, this one teacher I worked with, she did these amazing projects uh, with her primary students and they spoke at my Iris conferences and actually they were the best. They were amazing. These uh, little year five students, and they were tiny, were talking about how they'd researched Viking poo and they'd found whipworm uh, actually in there, weirdly connecting with this other research program on Whitman so they had done proper research with a local archaeological trust and that teacher I mean she had gone out of her way but then things just blossomed for her a bit like you know if you go with your passion she then got a Royal Society grant she set up uh, aquaponics and hydroponics in her school um, she's called Emma Crizel she teaches at um, uh, Richard Taylor primary school in Harrogate uh, and she's won awards for this because now they grow all their own food and I ran a TED countdown uh, with lots of students um, 
a couple of years ago. So we actually did a whole TED event and the students were amazing. And the TED, you know, hierarchy thought the students were met because they were brilliant. And the primary students were the best. They were <laughs> absolutely engaged, empowered. And I think so often they come like lots of the ones who come from primary schools who've done cool things carry on that momentum somehow we just need to keep all that imagination and creativity and support them to do cool things in primary schools really because you know I've given loads of talks and they sort of you show them a, a polar bear on a, an iceberg which is melting and they run and turn off all the lights and they get so passionate and it's just fantastic we've got a that's one of the things I'm trying to do at my school is create a space to have all those primary students in doing things, um, making things to increase biodiversity, uh, doing music, doing a whole range of different activities, which basically inspire them, empower them to be active and making a better planet, but in not too scary a way that, oh my God, it's all going to be awful. Somehow, if we got to be got to improve this climate anxiety for young people and empower them to feel they can do things and together they can collaborate. So I think primary, I know in so many ways, I'd love to do primary because, you know, I don't know, they so many good ideas, but I know there's still constraints there, but I think, you know, let them go with ideas.